Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you back to our final session in the series we've been in called Cold Case Christianity. In this series, we've been watching Jim Wallace, a uh, former cold case homicide detective, uh, as he investigates the claims that the Gospels make. And the reason this is so important, as we've talked about through this series, you know, is can they be trusted or can they be reliable? You know, the reason that's so important is because if what's written in the Gospels about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if it can't be trusted, okay, if it, if it can't, if it's not reliable, then, you know, we don't need to devote our lives to Him, okay, that, that we're wasting our time if that can't be trusted. This whole idea of Christianity is a waste of time. If what's recorded in the Gospels about Jesus simply cannot be seen as reliable in any way. So Jim uh, investigates the Gospel writers by using the same techniques that he used uh, in his cold cases. And Jim talked about in the series that cold cases are events that occurred in the past. There's no longer any living eyewitnesses and little to no physical evidence to examine. And he said the Gospels are, are pretty much the same. Uh, they describe events that occurred a long time ago. There's no living eyewitnesses anymore of these events. And there's little to no physical evidence that we have to look at. And so through this, through this series, Jim says the only way you can make a case in this circumstance is by looking at circumstantial evidence. And we've talked about through this series the difference between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. And that in our courts in America here today, a judge will tell you that circumstantial evidence is to be looked at with the same importance as direct evidence, that both carry the same weight. So to, to see whether the Gospels are reliable or not, we have to make it solely on a circumstantial case. So in the first three sessions, we answered this question. Is there any way to tell if what's been written in the Gospels about Jesus can be proved reliable at least beyond a reasonable doubt? Is it possible it's all fake, it's all made up? Sure it's possible. Anything's possible. But is it reasonable? Is it reasonable to think that based on the evidence that we have. And in those three sessions, Jim gave us a very convincing case that we can trust what's, what's written in the Gospels, uh, that, it can, that it looks to be reliable beyond a reasonable doubt, that, that it looks to be accurate in what it records. But many, pe many people would say that all this does is tell us that we have a well-preserved and accurate lie or we have a well-preserved and accurate myth or, or fairy tale. And the reason many would say that is because the Gospels say that supernatural events actually happen, that supernatural events are true. The greatest claim of a supernatural event in the Gospels we find is that Jesus rose from the dead. So many people, again, they simply say, yeah, you may have a, a, an accurate, well-preserved record of this, but it's a well-preserved and accurate lie because nobody comes back from the dead. And that's really the key. Everything hangs on the resurrection of Jesus. Our entire faith hangs on the resurrection of Jesus. The whole idea of Christianity depends on the resurrection of Jesus. It's the critical event. If it truly occurred, then it changes everything. So, we've got another question here. Is there any way to tell if the claim about the resurrection of Jesus that we find in the Gospels, is there any way to tell whether that is reliable or not? Can it be trusted or not? Well, in last week's session, Jim began to examine the most outrageous claim that the disciples of Jesus and the Gospel writers ever made about Him, and that was that He rose from the dead. And so Jim began to walk through all the, the possible explanations for why the disciples and why the gospel writers would have said that this was true, that it actually happened. And today he's going to finish going through those possible explanations uh, of why the gospel writers might have said this and then decide which one makes the most sense based on all the circumstantial evidence that we have available to us. Now, if you didn't see last week's video, let me encourage you to go back and watch that before you watch today's session. So, at this point, let's pick back up with Jim 
in part two of the cold case for the resurrection. Maybe they just didn't, saw this as a vision, you know, a hallucination. They wanted Jesus to be alive so badly. Look at Mary sees a gardener, and she says, oh, it's Jesus. It's, it's a, maybe it is a gardener. Maybe she just wanted to see Jesus so bad she imagined the gardener was Jesus. Couldn't that, I mean, that actually seems like it might be reasonable. I mean, think about the first sightings of Jesus. It's Mary. In these two accounts, she's by herself. And she wanted him to be alive. Maybe she imagined it. Or Peter. Peter sees him. In these two accounts, he's by himself. Peter certainly wanted Jesus to be alive. He made a lot of mistakes with Jesus. He wanted, I'm sure, to make amends for those. It gets a little dicier, though, with people like James. James, you know, we have an account here in 1 Corinthians where he sees him by himself, allegedly. But, you know, I don't, do you think that James really wanted Jesus, his brother, to be? I, maybe. He's his family. Okay, so maybe he wanted Jesus to be alive, too, so that's why. He's by himself. But then how about, like, this guy, Paul? Nobody else on the road to Damascus actually sees this vision except for Paul. But do you think Paul really wanted Jesus to be alive? It gets harder, I think, to explain here. And then you have problems with every other sighting that involves multiple eyewitnesses who see the same thing. Because let's face it, like the people on the road to Emmaus, these disciples, there's more than one person involved in this sighting. So if, if you told me, hey, uh, I told you last night I had a dream, and in this dream I was driving down Melrose Avenue in a, in a, uh, a, a new uh, Viper, and you said red, right? I'm like, mm, yeah. And you were listening to the radio. I said, well, yeah, how'd you know that? And you were listening to Ed Sheeran, right? I said, I'm starting to freak me out, okay, because I'll tell you something. If you have the same recollection that I have, that's not, no one has group dreams, okay? That's called a memory of something that actually occurred. This is what we have here. We have a number of sightings in which we have more than one person saying the same thing they experience at the same time. So what do we have here? Group hallucinations? You have the, the, the actual woman at the tomb. There's more than one. And then you have like sightings of the, of the smaller group sightings like when the disciples are at the sea and they see him at the seashore and they run to him. I couldn't get them all in this picture so I had to go a couple off screen there, sorry. Or you have the disciples who were there without Thomas. Well, you had Judas was already gone so you only had 11 minus Thomas. You got 10 here. 10 who saw all this at the same time. And then of course when Thomas gets back in the game, he joins the group and now you have the disciples plus Thomas so you have 11. And you have a couple of sightings like this, not just here. You have the, the mountaintop sighting where you have 11 who see him here at the mountaintop in Matthew 28. This is kind of a clever one I have for you here. How about the ascension of Jesus? Woohoo! You see his little feet up there? There he goes. Got a bunch of people here at the same time. And then you have in 1 Corinthians, you have Paul who says, dude, if you don't believe me, there are 500 people who saw Jesus arrive, uh, alive at the same time you can go ask them. So I try to give you a, a comprehensive list here. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't get 500, so I added a few extra. There we go. Now we're good to go. Okay? So how do you explain these kinds of, of, of sightings? It gets a little harder, I think. Also, if you wanted to falsify this, oh, you think you saw Jesus? Let's run back to the tomb and see if his body is in the tomb. But you get back to the tomb and the body's missing on top of it all. Now, that's different. Did somebody steal the body? If they stole it, now we're back to conspiracy theory. A lot of these theories roll back downhill to conspiracy theory because you have to account for the empty tomb. The one thing we all agree existed, even though in that minimal facts that Gary Habermas, the empty tomb is one of those minimal facts. So I think in the end, this is why Peter says, hey, we're not making this stuff up. We actually saw it with our own eyes. It's possible that they were mistaken, or, but it's just not reasonable. And all that matters is what's reasonable. Tired of hearing that yet? Okay, good. Maybe they were fooled. Maybe somebody was an imposter who said, hey, you know what? We can trick these guys and start a world religion. Do you know who this guy is here? If you work in a, forward or a fraud or a forgery in our city, eventually you might end up on the homicide team because you learn a lot, do a lot of search warrants. We have a lot of guys on our team that used to be fraud or forgery guys. This guy's a con artist. Probably the most famous con artist of all. His name is Charles Ponzi. He started what's known as a Ponzi scheme. The, the chief rule I've learned from guys who work fraud, who work con artists, is this. If you want to be successful conning somebody, you have to know more about the thing you're trying to con them about than they do. You might entice me to join your stupid business plan if I don't know much about business plans. 
you got to fool me. That means that in order to con the 12, I have to know more about Jesus than the 12. Because I gotta, this is the group I'm trying to fool. Now think about that for a second. Who, who would know more than the 12? It had to be somebody from the inner circle, and he'd need help. Why? Because he's got to get that tomb empty. We're back to a conspiracy theory. But here's the problem with any imposter. Remember the risen Jesus after the, the, the uh, resurrection from the crucifixion? is every bit as supernatural as the pre-crucified Jesus. The risen Jesus does all the same stuff that the Jesus did before. So if you're going to be a con artist, you've got to be good because you've got to be able to work miracles because you're going to see those. You've got to be able to do like appear, appear miraculously in the, in the room, pop in the room. And then you've got to be able to do that thing with the pulley and the, and the, and the rope, you know, where you've got to ascend into heaven. You've got to be good, like Las Vegas good, Okay. Because so, everything after the resurrection is every bit as miraculous as before the resurrection. Okay, it's, you know, is it possible? Sure, it's po anything's possible. I just don't think it's reasonable. Maybe they were just influenced by, this is a more recent theory that I think Bart actually holds, that maybe one of them who deeply wanted to see Jesus alive had a spiritual vision of Jesus and then was so influential that he convinced the others it actually happened. Okay. Well, who would that guy be? Who could be so influential they would have? Well, we know who the first observers of Jesus were. They were Mary. Do you think Mary has influence to convince the others that Jesus actually appeared? She couldn't even convince Peter he appeared. Remember? Peter, I just saw Jesus. Get out of the way. Let's go see what she saw. They don't believe her. I don't think she could do it. For a number of reasons, I don't think Mary could influence the others. And by the way, all the other group are group hallucinations. Is she going to uh, encourage them to have group hallucinations? I mean, think about it. Work it through. Maybe it's not Mary. Maybe it's somebody like Peter. Peter was definitely engaged in this and, you know, loved Jesus, and he was influential. But the problem with Peter, if you think about it, is he's not the first person who had a vision. Is he going to go back to Mary and say, hey, Mary, guess what? I saw Jesus today, and you saw him yesterday. A little Jedi mind trick on Mary. <laughs> no, come on. I mean, this is, that's, not, that's not reasonable. Maybe it's Paul. Paul definitely had, you know, uh, influence. But did he really have influence with the 12? That's the question. Here's what I want to do. Imagine a, an imaginary vision. I'm, I'm Peter. Here's Peter sitting right here. And I'm going to have an imaginary vision of Jesus. And I love Jesus, and I really want to see him alive. So if you were to ask G Peter about this imaginary vision after the fact... Peter, describe for me what you saw. I guarantee you his description would be vivid and detailed because he's the source. Got it? Detailed, vivid description. Now, if he tells his vision to the others, and now I go to the others and I say, hey, what about that vision? What about that when Jesus appeared? Tell me about it. Well, their description won't be anywhere near as detailed as Peter's because Peter's the source of the vision. <laughs> They're the secondary source of the vision. The problem I have is that every account we see in Scripture is from multiple sources with extensive detail. This might be a lie, but to think that this is just a transferred vision from Peter or anybody else of influence doesn't make any sense to me. And by the way, if you wanted to falsify Peter's vision, what would you do? You would run back to the tomb. And if you run back to the tomb and the tomb is empty, you don't have an imaginary vision problem, you've got a conspiracy theory again because someone's got to get the body out of the tomb to make the story work. Again, everything rolls back to the empty tomb. I don't think this is a reasonable explanation. Possible, just not reasonable. This next part's fast, because we've already done all the hard work. Maybe these were just legends distorted over time. We talked about that, right? But we have good reason to believe they're not legends distorted over time because of all the work we did in the last session. We know they're early accounts, and we know they've been attested repeatedly by the chain of custody. So the idea that they're somehow distorted over time doesn't work if you do the work. Make sense? So now we're back down through all of these. We've now gone through six explanations. I don't even think we could say that last one's even possible. The idea that they're distorted over time is just evidentially impossible. We know what the evidence shows over time. That one's, but I'll just give it to you. Okay, it's possible. That's just not reasonable. So let's go to the last one. Turns out these are the ones that atheists, me as an atheist, I would have offered one of these six. This is the one that you Christians want right here. 
They're just telling the truth about the resurrection. It's pretty simple. And by the way, this really does a good job of covering all the evidence in the room. This would make sense of all this evidence. This is the one that actually explains the evidence best. But I'm here to tell you that every single explanation on that, ball, on that wall has virtues and liabilities, like they always do. Every case I've ever worked, my prosecution case with the suspect, which I know he's our, our guy, it has strengths and it has weaknesses. Every case I've ever done in front of a jury has a weakness. This, these have weaknesses. We've already talked about all the weaknesses. But don't think for a second that your version as a Christian does not have a weakness. It's got a liability that's so large it kept me out as, as an atheist. Because the Christian explanation requires something I would have rejected outright. The Christian explanation requires a resurrection. And for me, as a philosophical naturalist, ain't no way we're going there. That's out. Makes no sense at all. Because my presuppositions as a philosophical naturalist would never have allowed me to go there. But I want you to think about what this whole investigation is. Anyone who's examining the resurrection, what are they trying to look at? They're trying to look at whether or not really God could do such a thing. They're examining whether or not a resurrection is reasonable or possible. They're trying to figure out whether or not a resurrection could ever occur. Well, if that's your question and that's the investigation you're starting, you cannot start with the presupposition that no resurrection could ever occur. Right? That's the thing you're trying to investigate. And I tell you, a lot of my friends and me too, I would have said, okay, look, show me some evidence. Oh, well, you know, these are early dating. They are dated really early. I don't care. Resurrections don't occur. Jump over that. Well, I can show you some other evidence here. You know, for example, they're quoted by non-Christian authors in the first century, all kinds of other, don't care. Resurrections don't occur. I'm committed to that presupposition. <laughs> Resurrections don't occur. Well, we've got other evidence here. I can show you all kinds of historical. I don't care what you show me. I don't care how much you show me. If I'm committed up front that resurrections don't occur, I will find a way to get around those pieces of evidence because I know whatever it might appear to be can't be what you think it is because resurrections don't occur. You see what the problem is? Is that if I, I'm always gonna end up with this conclusion because I refuse to give up where I started. I began with that conclusion. <laughs> and if you begin with a conclusion, you'll find a way to get there. That's called what? That's called circular reasoning, where I end up where I began because I refused to get off first base. Make sense? Remember I showed you this picture? This is the presupposition the officers had. They came in believing in advance this is an overdose. And so therefore, they found ways to look at this as evidence to support their presupposition. But it didn't end up being that way. So when we're looking at the issue of the resurrection, there's only one of two possibilities. Here they are. Question, what happened to Jesus? Well, he either rose from the dead or he didn't, okay? Pretty simple. Now, if I'm willing to consider all possibilities, including those that might be supernatural and as an explanation, that one might lead me to this, this conclusion. But here's the problem. I reject anything supernatural. That is a blockade. It stands in my way. I cannot get to this conclusion because I have this barricade, supernaturalism. Mm -mm 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 -mm. On the other hand, if I just consider the natural explanations that we talked about to begin with, I have all these six problematic barricades. But I'll tell you what, I'm willing to find a way to jump over, get around, do whatever I have to do to twist and turn to get around all these problem explanations to get to this. This is a much harder conclusion to get to, but I'm committed to do whatever it takes to twist and turn and do what I have to do to jump over to get to that conclusion. Really? On this path, there's only one problem, one barricade. And guess what, folks? I'm the reason why it's there. I put that barricade there. That barricade is my presupposition. <laughs> These problems are just the natural problems that come along with those explanations. This problem I created. Turns out I could actually remove that by simply not holding the presupposition. And if I do that, this road is clear. And the explanation makes sense of the evidence. The thing in my way is me. Got it? 
And for a lot of our friends who reject supernaturalism, I understand it. I get it. They're not even open to that. Okay. I just make the case because it turns out that God's in charge of that thing. You pray yourself through this. Your friends who you've explained it all and they seem to be going nowhere, you talk to God about those people. You do your part, God does his role. His role is foundational. I sometimes think what happens is we think as evangelists, as Christians sharing our faith, we think that we are like playing a game of tennis. We're on the clay courts, Wimbledon, the camera's rolling, it's hot, we're sweating, every point matters. We hit it back over, oh, it's out of bounds, oh, I lost that point, it's all on me, it's my fault. That is not what we're doing. This is not a game of tennis. This is a game of baseball. Your job is to get to the plate and do whatever you can to advance the runner to first. And you know what? When you get done, he may only be sitting on first. And then somebody else five years from now will come along and might get that guy to second. And I know this with Mormon, my Mormon family, this is very true. And then along the way, somebody else comes along and gets that guy to third. And then two years later, somebody else says something that God's moving in this guy's life and suddenly he's running home. And that guy who shared in that last moment goes, woohoo, I just brought somebody to Christ. No, you didn't. That guy was on third base leaning in. Dude, come on. You just did a little part of this because we're a team. So I want to encourage you, when you're sharing what you believe, this is not a game of tennis. And you might get done and think, I didn't accomplish anything. Because it doesn't appear you got a run in. Look, when I'm interviewing a suspect, I don't, I'm not trying to get home runs. I'm trying to get singles. I don't need him to confess. I need him to lie to me repeatedly so I can demonstrate to the jury he's a liar. That'll work for me. Enough singles, I'll drive in a run. We need to work as though we're just making singles. You are faithful and obedient to God when you get your butt up off the bench and get in the batter's box. That's it. If you make contact, great. You get a single, great. You don't make it, that's okay. You got off the bench, you did something. You do that, you're faithful. God credits that to your account. You get, good job, my faithful servant. You got off your butt for once and you tried. The rest, God takes care of this stuff. But he does allow us to play the game. Isn't that wild? So I want you to be encouraged. You may not see the movement you're looking for, but you are moving people. You just don't know it yet. Okay, I think in the end, it's all about the barricades that we put in place. And you see that the disciples, the authors of Scripture, are really good about describing who they are. When describing who they are, they'll say things like this. I spoke to the eyewitnesses. The people who are the sources of this information were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, Luke, said. Luke says. That's who Luke's interviewing. And Peter says, hey, we didn't follow a clever devised tales. We were eyewitnesses. And John says, guys, we actually were there from the beginning. We, we heard him. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. These are eyewitnesses who gave us an evidential trail. The last thing that we're going to call it a night. By the way, if you want follow-up materials, don't put this in your Google because you won't find it. It's in your browser, your internet browser. Put in coldcasechristianity.com forward slash resources. Oh, a lot of information, huh? A lot of information. I just want to encourage you, though, as you kind of move through and share your faith with your friends. It's not a race. Don't need to master it. Understand their presuppositions. Be faithful servants. Play the game of baseball. That's what we're doing. We're just making sure we play our role. And when you get to the end here and you see the power of the gospel and you see your friends change their lives for what... Look, I don't want to be an arguer. I'm not a case maker so I can win an argument. I want to be a case maker so I can pull down the barriers that stand between you and the gospel. Because it's the gospel that has the power to change everything. But sometimes we build a wall around the gospel. What we're doing here is developing the tools to bring down that wall brick by brick. In the end, what's important is the gospel. Make sense? And I know you're in a good church that's gonna teach you how to share the gospel. So I wanna encourage you to do one last thing. If you look, I know you sometimes feel probably bad that you're not an evangelist like Billy Graham, that you're not really doing what you should be doing. But you know, you may not be gifted in certain areas. It doesn't get you off the hook, don't get me wrong. But look at what it says in Ephesians 4. Paul says some of you are pastors, some of you are teachers, some of you are evangelists. 
Well, doesn't that mean then that some of you aren't those things? And some of you may not consider yourself to be an evangelist. And in that sense, you may not have that office of an evangelist. But Peter, in 1 Peter 3, says, some of you should be ready to make a case for what you believe. No. He says, all of you should be ready to give a reason for the hope you have in Jesus. So you may not consider yourself to be an evangelist, but you don't get out of this obligation to be a case maker. If you are a Christian, you are a case maker, according to Peter, because all of you have that responsibility. These are not separate, two, two separate things. So if you are in this room tonight because you came here tonight to see the case and you're not quite sure and you're thinking to yourself, is there really enough reason? Ask yourself, is it about there not being enough evidence to believe this is true? Or is it about you not wanting there to be enough evidence to make this true? There's a difference between these two things. But if you're here as a believer to learn all this stuff, I want to challenge you. The first decision you made was for Christ. The second decision needs to be to become a case maker. Make a decision to defend what you believe. Turns out it's easy to call yourself a Christian, isn't it? But it's hard to defend what you believe. I want you to do hard things. Because this life is not an easy life being a Christian. So I hope this has helped to prepare you. Now let's pray. Father, we just thank you for opportunities. Opportunities to just um, take the time necessary to walk through the evidence we know, we know that you have challenged us and we know that you have great respect for evidence. Jesus, we know that when challenged, you said, you know, um, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, believe the evidence of these miracles. And we know, Jesus, that when John's disciples came to you and said, hey, you know, we're, John sent us and he wants to know, are you the one? That you didn't scold them like you're not gonna scold us. And instead, you performed miracles in front of them and then said, go tell John what you just saw. So Father, give us the same healthy respect for evidence so we can make a case on the basis of what you've already shown us so we can make the case for you in this culture. We love you, Father, and we give you our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone here says, amen. amen. All right. So here is my hope for you, if you've been watching this series as a Christian. My hope is that you walk away from this with your faith strength. My hope is that now you know why you believe what you believe. Not just that you believe, not just you believe this simply because the Bible says so, or because you grew up in a Christian home, or because you grew up in the church. Those aren't good enough reasons. You need to know why you believe what you believe. And, and now you have a, a, a solid foundation for understanding that. You can have confidence that, you know, you have not placed your faith in a lie. You can have confidence knowing that you haven't devoted your life to a myth or a fairy tale. But you know, it needs to go further than that if you're a Christian. Because now you have the tools, you have the resources to be able to make this same kind of case with others who don't believe yet. You know, Jim shared in the video that all of us have a responsibility to be case makers. Not all of us are gifted the same. Some of us are going to be more gifted at evangelism or teaching or different things. But that doesn't get us off the hook that all of us have the responsibility to be case makers for what we believe, to be able to explain why we have confidence in placing our faith you know, in Jesus, in, in what's recorded in Scripture about Jesus. Because here's the thing, we live in a day where if someone asks you why you're a Christian, your answer is, well, because the Bible says so. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We live in an age where many people are very skeptical of the Bible in general, but specifically what it says about Jesus. So we need to first be able to show them, you know, why, why they can trust, at least beyond a reasonable doubt, why they can trust what the Gospels say about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you've been watching this series and you're not a Christian, my question is simply this. What are you going to do with the evidence that's been presented to you? If this is true, 
It's the most important event in the history of the universe. It changes everything. If this is true, then your eternity depends on the decision that you make regarding Jesus. Do you believe that He's the Son of God? Do you believe that He took on human form so He could come to this earth, live a sinless life, and then die for us, die in our place to pay the penalty for sin that we never could because there's no way we could live a sinless life. He, he paid that penalty. He paid that debt. Do you believe that? Do you believe that He rose from the dead? And that if you place your faith in Him as your Savior and you devote your life to Him, to His teachings and following in His ways, that you will have the promise of eternal life with God. That you will have the promise one day, if we die before Jesus returns, as the scriptures say, say, that you will have the promise of being resurrected just like He was, and then spend eternity with God. I hope that's the decision that you'll make. Now I understand you may have a lot more questions and other things you'd like to talk about before you can feel confident in making a decision like that. And if that's where you are, let me encourage you, don't, don't let the moment just pass by. Contact us here at the church. We'd love to set up a time where we could just sit down and, and listen to your story, uh, listen to the questions that you have or the, the doubts you may be struggling with to be able to really believe that this is true and just be able to sit down and talk with you about those things. We'd love to be able to do that with you. So uh, just contact us here at the church and we can set up a time to do that together. As we finish out this series, let me just ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are I'm so thankful that you've given us so much evidence not just about Jesus, but about this world that you created, things that we can look at to know that there had to be an all-powerful, sovereign hand behind everything that we see. Lord, you've given us plenty of evidence to believe, and I'm thankful for that. You've not asked, asked us to uh, just have blind faith, to, to not be able to have our doubts and questions answered, Lord. You've provided many answers for us. And so I'm, I'm thankful for that, Lord. I'm thankful for what your son has done for us, as we just talked about. He came to pay that penalty for sin that we never could. To die on that cross for us, Lord. To show us that kind of love. To lay down his life for us. But that it didn't end there. And that your son rose from the dead. And because that occurred, he defeated death in that act. He, de he defeated hell in that act as well. And also gave us the opportunity from that point on to be able to place our faith in Him as our Savior and know that we can have a future with You forever. We thank You for that, Lord. Help us as Christians. Uh, help us to be effective case makers for You. To understand, just to play the role that You've given us and leave, leave the outcome in Your hand, Lord. Understand that you, know, you do so much work behind the scenes in the lives of people, but if we'll just be faithful and at least stepping up and being able to tell others why we believe what we believe, Lord, that you can, you can use that in ways we can't even imagine. So again, thank you for all the grace that you've shown us and the love that you have for us. I pray we live a life that honors that uh, and does a life that does everything we can in the time we have on this earth to share that good news with others. All of us who pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody.